So welcome everybody. Um, thank you for all, all of you for being here and also I want to thank the organizers for taking a big risk and inviting me to give you a talk here. Somebody who knows next to nothing about DAP, but uh, we'll see how things go. Um, so I'm really going to talk about oxygen and how that links to energy. And uh, I'm not working on, on whales, but I thought it would be uh, nice to actually, uh, sharks, sorry. But I thought it would be nice <laughs> to show uh, that this is a very large fish and the reason why it can become so large is that it has these huge gills locked inside its head. Um, so this is really my perspective on things. So I like to keep things simple. So we have a molecule of oxygen, some food, and then you burn that, you generate energy, and that is the energy that's necessary to stay alive. Um, and the reason why oxygen translates so well to energy is basically because it doesn't really matter what kind of substrate you burn. You can burn fats, uh, carbohydrates like glucose, or proteins. It takes different amounts of oxygen, per, but per molecule of oxygen, you more or less generate 400 kilojoules. So oxygen can be really used as a synthetic measure of energy. Um, and of course, that's one of the reasons why this quote is here, that uh, to, to actually stress the importance of energetics to ecology. So this is a quote by Brown, and I realize it's a bit dodgy to put this up here. Um, and I don't necessarily subscribe to the whole theory of him, but I think it's a really powerful statement of saying how important metabolism or energy budgets are in the field of ecology, if you liken that to how important genetics is to understand evolution. So um, why do I find oxygen so interesting? So this is a, an aquatic animal, and you can see that in the air, there's a lot more oxygen, so oxygen is more likely to become a limiting resource underwater. And that's, of course, why all these animals have gills to ventilate, uh, to take up an additional oxygen. And the other reason why oxygen is more likely to become limiting underwater is because the oxygen diffusion is about orders of magnitude lower in water. So you have a double problem. Not only does less oxygen dissolve in water, uh, maybe 20, 30 times less, but also there's a much uh, lower diffusion rate. And so there's a bit of a puzzle there that uh, still you find a lot of aquatic giants, perhaps, in the water. So, uh, of course, there's a very famous example where you have a very large, well, griffin fly, it's a, an early dragonfly, if you like. Uh, and of course, the larvae presumably also lived underwater where they did all of the growing. So. Um, this is a, basically an aquatic giant. Uh, similarly, you have large trilobites, eurydipteroids, uh, other animals, and they all, this is the size of a man, so they're all quite, uh, quite large. So now you can actually see things. Um, and so we have all these examples of aquatic giants, but perhaps not surprisingly, these are all found in a time in the geological past when the oxygen levels were thought to be uh, almost uh, 30 or 35 percent of oxygen compared to the 20 percent we have now. So these are all times when the atmosphere was really hyperoxic. Um, and this is referred to as Paleozoic gigantism. Of course, uh, we live in the present. And still here there are examples, many examples of aquatic giants. Only here they're not found under uh, high oxygen conditions per se, but especially in cold water. So in the Antarctic, we have this colossal squid, which is a diver here, so you can see how big it is. We have these giant pycnogonids. Um, but also in the deep sea, we have these things which you might recognize as a gamerous, which usually are about a few centimeters. And this is actually a gloved hand, so this is a real gigantic uh, monster. Okay. Um, and this is referred to as polar gigantism, so there's probably something about temperature that might also drive body size. So um, I put on this slide 
basically for two reasons. One, it shows how much I know about DEP, and everybody else puts a slide like this. I, I don't want to be left alone. Um, the other thing is uh, it, it might explore some common ground. So basically, this is how it works. You have food supply first entering the reserve before it's allocated to any of these processes. Um, and then temperature affects the rates at which uh, these arrows work, the, 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 the rates at which oxygen, uh, food is taken up and uh, how it's allocated. Um, for example, using the utilization rate. So what, what I was missing here was actually the oxygen. Of course, it's there, it's hidden, um, but it might be a bit more um, explicit. So basically, we also have oxygen supply here, which the animal needs to take up. Um, and then it, in the animal, it's either used to, uh, used to convert the food to reserves or to mobilize this as a utilization rate. Uh, but oxygen is also important, and it can be a limiting resource, perhaps especially so in aquatic animals, where oxygen is, is less available. Um, and if you look at uh, respiration physiology, there are several things uh, to, to, to notice or to measure. Um, and well, one of the things that people usually measure is a standard metabolo metabolic rate. It's usually in animals that don't digest anymore, so they have a, a very low um, metabolism, and that's sometimes equated to, to maintenance, um, because that's just the energy the animal needs to keep staying alive. Um, and I, I put it in red because it tends to be viewed as a cost, a, a cost to stay alive. So it's, it's like a burden to the animal. If you have a large standard metabolic rate, then uh, you need a lot of energy just to, to stay alive. Um, but there's also something like maximum metabolic rate, which is basically the capacity of animals to take up oxygen. And uh, that's usually seen as, as something good. So if you have a large uh, capacity to take up oxygen, you basically can do whatever you want. You can generate lots of energy, provided you have enough food, of course. Um, and then the utilization rate might be approximated by, maybe by routine metabolic rate, which is basically a mix of the two. So that's just to, to explore some common ground in, in our thinking. Um, but really, this talk is about three aspects which can be derived from, from such a, a framework, um, and which are in my opinion, really interlinked, and that's body size, or L cubed, um, temperature, and oxygen. So I'll center my talk around these three parts. Uh, first, talking about responses in body size, responses in thermal tolerance, and responses in metabolism, and then we'll see how things go. So um, part one, so this is work I came into contact with when I started my postdoc in Plymouth, working with uh, Professor John Spicer. And um, I was interested in oxygen, and I came across this paper and, uh, by uh, uh, Chappelle and, and Lloyd Peck. And what they basically showed was that, for, again, for these gamma rays, there's an increase in body size on the y-axis, which is basically the 95 percentile of uh, length, and uh, against the water oxygen content. Um, and, and, and you can see this is a really snug line, so the R, R squares 0.98 or something, so really convincing. Um, and, and nature thought so as well, so everybody happy. Um, so I thought this is a real good example showing that oxygen is actually very important for body size. And of course, I shouldn't have to explain this, but um, it's all related to surface area to volume ratios. Um, so I, I'll I'm not saying that you don't know this, but I'm trying to make a popular video about how things work. So if you have any feedback on this uh, animation, just <laughs> let me know. But the idea here is that it shows visually that as you grow larger, your uh, volume increases more strongly than your surface area. And so the idea is that larger animals have a very uh, low ratio of su surface area to volume, and therefore they are uh, running into problems to maintain oxygen uptake to meet oxygen demand. OK, um, so if we look a bit closer on, on, on this graph, we see this 
uh, change in water, water oxygen content, and that's basically a, a temperature decline. So we are now talking about body size, oxygen, and temperature, and that's because there's a relationship between the solubility of oxygen and temperature, as you probably all know. With increasing temperature, uh, water can actually hold less oxygen because the solubility declines. And um, as an ecologist, I thought, well, that's how things work. So I was quite convinced with, uh, with this scheme that oxygen supply actually generates body size, and then oxygen supply is controlled by temperature, and that's the explanation to that. But um, being exposed to uh, physiologists, they pointed out to me that there were some things uh, that might not be correct. So is something wrong here? So this is the time where we do a little bit of an interaction, uh, and uh, I've listed some of the answers, and the good answer is among these. Um, so the, the question is, is something wrong here? So you can think about it in that several ways. You can think maybe um, oxygen diffusion is not driven by water co oxygen content, by concentrations, but it's actually driven by differences in partial pressure. Um, you can say, well, oxygen amount is, is also affected by temperature, so how much of this thermal gradient is actually uh, confounded also by an effect on oxygen demand. Um, or you can say, well, hang on, this is a two-fold increase in oxygen, and it's almost a six-fold increase in body size, which means that's a six-cubed increase in volume, so how does that work out? Um, so just to, to have some interaction, who thinks it's A? Raise your hands. Two, three, okay. Who thinks it's B? Raise your hand. Again, one, two, three. Uh, so the rest all think it's C. Some people are undivided. I see some people uh, also raising their hand all the time, like I did, um, which is good. So everybody who raised their hand gets it right. So we'll start with, um, with the last one. So this is, well, this is not work I've been doing, but um, somebody much more intelligent than me pointed out this problem. And as a physiologist, uh, it's really difficult to, to couple a, a two-fold increase in, 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 in supply to a six-fold increase in length. The numbers don't really match up. If you do the calculations, you, you would expect maybe um, a 1.4 increase in, in body length. So uh, that might suggest that there's something amiss here. So uh, something John Spicer pointed out to me, that although ecologists tend to equate oxygen concentrations and oxygen partial pressures, which sometimes is equivalent, it's not necessarily the case. So uh, a striking example he used was in, in fish, the blood contains a lot of oxygen, so the concentration of oxygen in the blood of fish is really high because of all these respiratory proteins like hemoglobin. So if oxygen were to diffuse based on gradients and oxygen concentration, the oxygen would actually diffuse out of the blood of the fish into the water. Clearly, that's not what's happening. And that's because there's a difference in partial pressure. Um, and so oxygen diffusion is really driven by partial pressure and not by concentration. Um, of course, there's still a problem there, because then how do you explain this relationship? So there was a bit of a, an argument back and forth, and it wasn't really resolved. Um, and, and I was intrigued by that, because I thought, well, the answer must be there somewhere. Um, so here comes my small contribution. Um, so what I did is I basically revisited the, 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 the laws of diffusion, so the Fick equation. And uh, basically this is the oxygen uptake or oxygen diffusion, uh, and it's governed by this formula. So you're all familiar with formulas much more than I, so that's good. Um, basically there are these three components highlighted in different colors, and, and we have some animal-specific things like surface area or the thickness of the gill epithelium. Um, and what I, what my small contribution is basically saying, well, these don't really matter for the general thing, because animals differ in these aspects, but anyway, oxygen supply should be proportional to the product of all those three um, factors. So let's have a look at these three factors. So 
Uh, note that I'm, I'm mainly talking about the external supply, so I'm not talking about this whole cascade for how much oxygen is in the gills and the whole, the whole cascade down to the mitochondria where the oxygen is actually used. It's also interesting. But so this is basically forgetting about all the internal animal-specific things, but mainly focusing on what happens in the environment, how much oxygen is available there. And then it, I, I argue it should be proportional to those three things. So the first one is, is uh, solubility here. We already saw that, that that's something that declines with temperature. Um, but the other things uh, are uh, also dependent on temperature. So we saw solubility. Uh, partial pressure is actually more or less invariant with temperature. And uh, the, the third component, which is the diffusivity, is actually increasing with temperature. So I, I liken that to the increase in molecule movement with temperature. And so what actually happens is if you combine all those three things, uh, you find something which I found very counterintuitive because I was trained as an ecologist and I, I therefore believed that warm waters hold less oxygen, so there's less oxygen available in warmer waters. Um, and there is less oxygen, but there's more oxygen available because it diffuses faster. So the increase in diffusivity with temperature more than makes up for the decrease in solubility. And so therefore, the index slightly increases with increasing temperature, which was uh, interesting. Um, this also means that some of the notions that I had about oxygen availability needed to be revisited. So, for instance, here we have um, the, the pattern in oxygen solubility, and you can see with increasing temperature it declines. Also, with increasing salinity it declines, because salt water can hold less oxygen than fresh water. Um, and so, warm saline water holds even less oxygen. But if you look at the oxygen supply index, also taking into account the diffusivity, um, Again, there is a decrease with salinity, because salinity doesn't affect the diffusivity, but actually with temperature there's an increase. So even though you might get the same patterns for oxygen concentration along environmental clines, the actual availability might not uh, differ in tandem. So that was really interesting. And it also means that from an ecological point of view, you really need to know the physics, what, what's happening here. Um, it still left me with a problem because we saw that with uh, the amphipods, the larger animals were found in the colder water, uh, and uh, that should hold more oxygen. That was the reason why they became so large. But actually, in cold water, there's less oxygen available. And what we tend to see is that there's an oxygen shortage in warm water. Now, you can't really explain that by just looking at the oxygen supply. So in order to explain that, you have to incorporate this effect of temperature on the oxygen demand, so you have to incorporate physiological knowledge. Um, so oxygen really forges a link between the, the environmental, ecological aspects and the internal animal physiology. Um, and so the, the idea to explain uh, polar gigantism is uh, basically if the temperatures drop, then there's a larger difference between how much oxygen is there and how much oxygen you, you need, so there's actually an increase relative to demand. So I've put that in, a, in an animation as well. Uh, so this is cold temperature, this is warm temperature. And of course, in the cold water, more oxygen dissolves than in the warm, and we have larger animals. Um, and the traditional explanation was that's how it works. Um, but the, the new explanation still accounts for the same uh, concentrations. But the difference is that in the warm water, per time unit, a lot more oxygen diffuses into the animal but at the same time, they need a lot more oxygen. So if you express the oxygen supply relative to demand, you actually um, get a, a much better um, difference. So here, the, the difference in concentration is 2 to 1, but the difference in relative supply might be 6 to 1. So that might better explain the differences between uh, the amphipods. Uh, so that's, this is basically how it works. So we want to explain polar gigantism it's, it's basically an arrow that way. And the explanation for Paleozoic gigantism, therefore, is, is quite different, because that doesn't shift uh, this line that way, but it shifts the, the oxygen supply upwards. And so there's a real fundamental difference between two different forms of gigantism. Um, and if you want to read more about that, you can have a look at some of those 
paper, so you can ask me after the conference. But for now, I'll just team along to part two, which is um, looking not on, not on the si body size, but on uh, the temperature part of things. So um, what we saw was this graph, oxygen demand increasing, oxygen supply increasing as well, but uh, at some point the animal needs more oxygen at some temperature than uh, it can actually obtain from the environment. Uh, and so the, the, the idea was that heat tolerance, the temperature which the animal succumbs to heat, is actually not a function of temperature per se, but it's a problem with getting enough oxygen. Um, and, and one of the, the immediate consequences would be if you change the amount of oxygen in the water, then you would also change the thermal tolerance of the animal that you observe. Uh, and again, that's not thought about by me, but uh, people uh, in, in Hans Portner's lab uh, have worked on, on the eel pout, and they found good evidence suggesting that for that fish, uh, heat tolerance limits are indeed oxygen limited. Uh, and then they claimed it to be a, a universal general rule. Uh, people working on insects said, well, it doesn't apply to our animals. Uh, and there was this bit of a dilemma, or what, 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 what's happening here? Um, and so it could be related to this animal using trachea to breed, so it's, uh, it doesn't have a circulation system, uh, or it could be related to oxygen being more limiting in water, as I've tried to show you. So my contribution here was to actually marry those two things and uh, work on aquatic insects, which have trachea and breed underwater, to try and see what's happening there. Um, and since that was new for me, I, I thought I, I'm, I better maximize my success chances. So I took the largest animal I could find, which was uh, this predator, stonefly, and they come up to four or five centimeters, the females. Um, and they are called stenothermic, and they live in well-oxygenated water, so they're bound to be very sensitive to oxygen and temperature. So I thought, well, if any animal should show it, this is the one. Um, and I took it to the lab. Um, I measured respiration in a closed respirometry set, and I also videoed their responses as I heated up, ramped up the water, um, which um, looks like this. So you can see the animals happily crawling here at 22 degrees, and you can also see that they're doing this uh, push-up behavior, which is basically an effort to increase ventilation and flow of water and hence oxygen to their gills. Um, and they also have tegument respiration. And what I was able to show was that the critical thermal maxima, which is basically the temperature at which they enter a comatose state, was indeed dependent on oxygen. So we had about two and a half degrees, one degree, difference between normoxia, 20 kilopascals, hypoxia, and hyperoxia. So it seemed to fit that oxygen supply could indeed alter these thermal tolerance limits. Um, of course, we also wanted to know if it's related to oxygen demand. So for each of those NIMS uh, in the experiment, I also measured metabolic rate and how it increased with temperature, so expressed as a, as a Q10. And, and this high variation is basically because the larvae spent a number of years underwater, so there was a large difference in body size. Um, and again, what we saw was that within each treatment, there was an, a decline. So larvae with a high Q10 value, so they quickly increased oxygen uptake under warmer conditions, actually uh, had a lower thermal tolerance, presumably because they ran out of oxygen faster. Um, and one of the other things, which wasn't that strong, but did show up when it had a larger data set, was that larger individuals had slightly lower heat tolerance levels as well. Um, but it was a very faint signal. But it, ag it again seems to match the idea that larger animals are more oxygen limited. Um, just to, to finish this off, um, we also looked at anaerobic metabolism. So we have all these glycolytic uh, and products, met metabolites being increased under hypoxia. And if we had the same temperature under hyperoxia, lots of those patterns were abolished, again suggesting that the animals experience oxygen limitation and therefore they enter this fermentation state. Um, so it, it seems to work for aquatic insects, or at least this one, um, not all of them. And uh, one of the questions I had then was, well, why don't the animals just increase uh, 
their uh, capacity to regulate oxygen uptake? Why don't they take up more oxygen? Um, for instance, by having more permeable uh, teguments or having larger gills. Um, and, um, well, that, the, the answer to that is basically because that's quite difficult to do, but on an evolutionary perspective, you could argue, well, surely if, if having an excess capacity to take up oxygen is so important for energy generation, growth, fecundity, and the whole uh, performance or fitness of an animal, then surely evolution should have kicked in to maximize some of those uh, parameters. Um, and that's basically stemming from this kind of thinking that oxygen is uh, a good thing. So it uh, uh, boosts the immune system, it helps in cases of depression, improves physical performance. Well, I can, I can buy into that. Some of those others are, are a bit dodgy. Um, but there's actually something uh, too much of a good thing. So we all know Dr. H Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where you have this double-faced aspect, and oxygen is actually quite toxic if you have too much of it. It generates uh, radical oxygen species, which damage your cell parts, and that's basically what we all experience is the wear and tear of aging. And also in, uh, in the animals, we find some evidence suggesting that indeed oxygen can become toxic. So this is work done by uh, Stefan Hetz and, and Tim Bradley, working on, uh, on discontinuous gas exchange in terrestrial insects. And what they showed was they, they actually measured the oxygen concentrations inside the animal, inside the tracheal system. And if you increase the atmospheric ambient oxygen levels, um, the animal, if it, if it wouldn't regulate, would actually increase the internal uh, as well. But what you actually see is that they seem to regulate that at a very low level of oxygen. And uh, they argue that that's to do with uh, mitigating or preventing uh, oxygen poisoning. Now, of course, with when you breathe air, that's quite easy. You can just shut your spiracles and, and don't breathe anything, and that, that helps. And if you need more oxygen, you can easily uh, increase ventilation rates. But in aquatic animals, that's quite difficult. So yes, maybe it would have been fe uh, advantageous for animals to have an increased uh, oxygen uptake by having more permeable membranes. But when they don't use the oxygen, when they are inactive, then they are flooded with oxygen, which might be a bit poisonous. So increasing uptake capacity likewise increases the risks of, of oxygen poisoning. And I guess that's one of the reasons why aquatic animals are very poor at regulating that. that. So uh, underwater is a low oxygen availability, but if you want to increase your oxygen uptake, you have to move lots of water, which is very dense and very viscous. So that might be a bit of a problem, or at least it, it generates a lot of costs involved uh, to that. So what, what one of the things you tend to see a lot in aquatic animals is that they also um, augment their oxygen uptake capacity by having tegument breeding. So basically using every part of the body surface to, act, to uh, uptake oxygen. And even adult fish uh, rely on tegument breeding for, for quite a big part of the resting metabolism. Um, and so if the uh, aquatic ectotherms are very poor in regulating oxygen uptake, they have this problem when the water temperature become warmer in meeting their oxygen demand. And so we were actually able to show that across four different insect orders. Each time we actually saw that uh, thermal tolerance went down with lower oxygen levels. So at normoxia, 20 kilopascals, uh, oxygen, uh, thermal tolerance was uh, higher than at low oxygen. Again, suggesting that there's a general phenomenon here that aquatic insects seem to be vulnerable to this oxygen limitation effect. Um, but of course, not all animals breed the same way, and especially in aquatic animals, there's quite a variety in, in modes of respiration. Uh, so we, we wondered if the ability, the capacity of an animal to regulate its oxygen uptake, does that relate to the extent to which thermal tolerance is depressed by this hypoxic uh, effect? Uh, so we did a comparative study looking at two uh, bugs, two hemipterans, aquatic hemipterans, but they differed uh, in a crucial aspect. This is a, a surface exchanger, and it also has a physical gill to uh, have diffusion, but it basically relies a lot on just surfacing and, and aerial exchange, especially when the, the water temperatures increase. 
And the other animal, which is uh, closely related, is a, a plastron breeder. It's very flat, it has very uh, large surface area to volume ratio, and it basically relies on oxygen diffusion from the water into um, uh, the thin layer of air that's called the plastron. Um, and what we were able to show was that Indeed, in the surface exchange, nothing really happens if you increase or decrease the oxygen levels. So it's very invariant. But uh, the plastron breeder, which basically relies on oxygen diffusion and has less respiratory control, less ability to regulate oxygen uptake, is very much affected by uh, the oxygen content of the water. Um, so uh, in, a, in the next experiment, what we did was we actually denied this animal access to air, basically reducing its ability to regulate oxygen uptake. And what you see then is uh, that it really becomes responsive to low oxygen as well. So we could induce oxygen-limited thermal tolerance by, by reducing experimentally the, 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 the capacity to take up oxygen here. Um, and, if, and this animal doesn't surface even if you provide it with air, so nothing really changes there. Um, and so for all of these insect orders, we could actually find similar pairs of species that uh, are, were better at, at taking up oxygen. And in each case, they actually were above the line and also had a very uh, uh, much less responsive to low oxygen levels. Um, so that's just to sum up uh, part two, which uh, basically sums up like oxygen can actually limit thermal tolerance, even in tracheated insects. Uh, but the degree to which oxygen does so is uh, governed by the capacity to take up oxygen. So let's focus on taking up oxygen. So what I uh, emphasized was that there is this uh, balance between the risks of oxygen toxicity and the risks of asphyxiation. And that also explains why we have this whole cascade, because at the level of the mitochondria, the radical oxygen species are generated. So you need to have very low levels of oxygen, which are just right in the orders of three or four kilopascals to keep the mitochondria turning over at uh, the, the correct rate. Um, and also, because animals don't want to flood themselves or asphyxiate when there's too little oxygen, that's probably also the reason why we didn't find a large signal for body size in the thermal tolerance bit. Um, and that's probably because larger animals do compensate for their smaller surface area by um, maybe having more gills or having more permeable tegument. Um, so you, you would think about first principles that body size is important for the difference in, in surface area to volume ratio, and it probably is. But the animal probably has ways of compensating for that, and so in, in reality, you don't see to f seem to find such a strong effect on, on thermal tolerance. Um, so focusing on, on the ability to regulate oxygen intake, it really focuses for the aquatic animals on uh, being able to ventilate your body. Um, so, and that's related to the costs and benefits. So one of the things I mentioned was that water is uh, more viscous than, than at least than air. Um, and the uh, um, the consequences of that is that there's a thin boundary layer enveloping the animal, and the animal has to actually disrupt this boundary layer to, to, to uh, increase oxygen diffusion to its tissues. Uh, and one of the, th the other things to note here is that uh, the, the degree to which animals are affected by this boundary layer really depends on the Reynolds numbers, on the, and that again depends on being the large. So large animals essentially have less problems with viscosity because they can more easily disrupt the uh, boundary layers. Um, so if you want to focus on, on the ability to regulate oxygen intake, it really has to uh, look at the costs of doing so and the benefits. Well, the costs are obviously an energetic cost of moving a lot of water, and the benefits are, of course, having fresh oxygen supply. Um, and because of this uh, size dependency, um, there's actually uh, a transition. So if you have small animals, because they are so small, they, they basically live in a viscous world, there's a high cost for moving the water. Um, or you could say there's a low benefit because any movement doesn't really re result in a, in a displacement of water. Whereas if you are very large, 
then this is a relatively low cost of moving water, and, and that generates benefits. Um, and so there is, this is not a linear line, but there's actually a transition there for, where the animal transit, transitions from living in a viscous world to being more organized by inertia, um, which is basically expressed by, by the Reynolds numbers. So um, you would say that living on the water where you actually have to ventilate your gills and move viscous and dense water, uh, it pays off to be larger. Um, but the thing to note here as well is that this changes when the water temperature changes. So when uh, water is colder, it becomes more viscous. So the ventilatory efficiency of small animals decreases even more because they have even more problems with uh, high viscosity. And it actually can increase above that line for larger animals, and that's because the solubility of oxygen is still higher under cold conditions. So uh, they can still, with each amount of water they ventilate, they actually move more molecules of oxygen. Um, and so this line is actually different here. And, and presumably the transition between living in a, a viscous world and a, being dominated by inertia also shifts towards larger body sizes. So there's a real advantage of growing larger, especially in uh, cold viscous water, which is uh, summarized here. Um, so coming back to the original one, uh, the temperature effect is not only just on the rates itself, but it might also be a size dependency involved there, where uh, temperature influences uh, the scaling relationship here or the scaling relationship of uh, oxygen demand. Um, and that's because uh, at, at the lower temperature, the boundary layers will restrict gas exchange, especially in the small organisms. And so the scaling exponents are expected to be steeper in, in cold water. Um, so that's a prediction I made in, uh, in one of the papers. And I thought it would be nice to test that prediction. And one of the things I came up with was that it would be interesting to actually compare scaling exponents at different temperatures, both in water breeders and air breeders, because this mechanism only works in aquatic animals, where they actually have this viscosity problem. Um, so I teamed up with Craig White, and I, I posed him this question, and he was very kind. He just said, oh, I have the data. I'll, I'll run the analysis. I'll give you the graphs. And this is basically what came out. It was exactly as predicted, which doesn't happen a lot, um, but maybe it does with Craig. So maybe that was the, the reason why it worked so well. Um, anyway, here we, we see mass again and, and metabolism in fish. And of course, fish breed in the water, so they have this viscosity problem. And what you can see indeed is in the cold temperatures, the slopes are uh, steeper. And in the warm temperatures, the slopes are shallower, as would be predicted because basically the small animals can profit a lot more from the decrease in, in viscosity. And uh, Craig assured me that this is all statistically significant, so that's good. Um, but of course, the, the, the real test is also, does it still not apply to the air breeders? And he also had a data set on uh, lizards. And what you can see is basically here the lines are parallel, so that's what you would expect, higher temperatures increase metabolic rate but invariant of body size, so they all are stacked together. Uh, and if anything, the lines actually start to diverge a bit more, but that wasn't significant, so that's, that's good. Um, and so there seems to be some merit in, in having this size dependency of breeding and the effects of temperature on viscosity. Uh, and I took this a, a step further with a master's student who's worked on uh, mollusks, and, and this is still very much work in progress, because, but because a lot of people here are working on bivalves, I thought I showed it anyway. So the idea is that um, we have, this, again, these, these scaling relationships, and it does seem to be steeper at a cold temperature than at a warm temperature, um, at least in the bivalves, but not in the gastropods. Here, the lines are parallel. And the explanation there is that the bivalves continuously have to pump water for foraging uh, and for breeding, and with the gastropods, movement of water is maybe less of an issue. Um, okay, uh, and uh, this pattern uh, was consistent both for freshwater and marine bivalves, so we're trying to get this in a paper. Um, but one of the things that you might notice is that the number of species is quite low here, so 
if you happen to have data on species that might be useful for this analysis, let me know, and we might be able to uh, combine that. Um, but it, it shows that this, this size dependency of viscosity might actually have a similar effect on freshwater uh, marine animals, depending on how they breed. So that's one uh, empirical uh, result corroborating or supporting uh, this, uh, this idea of uh, size dependency and viscosity. Um, another piece of work which I wanted to stress was um, something which is maybe a bit more in, uh, related to some of the things you're working on, and that's related to size responses, growth responses uh, to temperature. Um, and so basically there's this puzzle of the temperature size rule where animals end up being smaller in warm water, but initially their growth uh, is, is faster, which is basically shown here for uh, phantom midges, Charboris. Um, so reared at two temperatures, uh, and this is time. Uh, and basically the, the warmer ones start to hit off faster, they grow faster, but eventually they are being surpassed by, by the cold ones. Um, and the puzzle here is that usually uh, if, you, if you stimulate growth, for example by giving animals more food, then you also stimulate uh, the final size. So if you rear animals on the abundant food, they grow faster and they become larger eventually. If you rear animals on the low food conditions, they grow slower and they also become a bit stunted at the end. Uh, not so with temperature. So temperature seems to have this effect discoupled. So at some point, temperature actually increases growth, and at some point, temperature actually decreases growth. So there's a bit of an enigma there. Um, one of the ideas uh, we came up with was actually that oxygen might become a limiting resource, especially for the larger animals. Uh, and not so much for the smaller animals. Um, and if that's the mechanism, then there's several things you would expect. Uh, you would expect hypoxia to become stronger, or cause a stronger temperature size rule, temperature size response. Uh, and that's actually what uh, a PhD student of mine is, is working on, Nathan Hoefnagel. He's working on uh, uh, this nice freshwater isopod, Acellus. And uh, I made him rear 3,000 newborns. He, he looks a bit unconvinced that that's the way to go, but um, he did all the work. Um, so we started out with 3,000 uh, newborns. We didn't rear them all to adulthood because there was some mortality. Uh, but the thing here is that we actually have a factorial design of two temperatures, and within each temperature we had uh, three levels of oxygen, so hypoxic, normoxic, and hyperoxic. And then we replicated everything 10 times and started out with 50 animals per pot. So that's how we get to this 3,000. Um, and so this is the result. So lots of measurements. Also, in some treatments, there's lots of mortality, which might not be uh, strange, because in the warm waters and the hypoxic conditions, you would expect to have this problem. Uh, interestingly enough, warm temperatures and high oxygen, hyperoxic, also seem to uh, do not well for the, for the survival, so there might be some toxicity effects there. Um, but uh, I'll summarize it by collating the two cold graphs and the warm graphs into uh, one graph. And what you can see is that, indeed, we find a, a temperature size rule where the warmer ones grow faster but uh, decline earlier, and they're eventually being caught up by, by the cold ones. So this is basically the temperature size rule but we only see that response under low oxygen conditions. So even under normoxia, and, and especially under hyperoxia, we see a, a reversal of that pattern. Um, now, the thing to know about Acellus aquaticus is that it's really a benthic animal, and is really tolerant to low oxygen. Um, so 10% oxygen is maybe normoxic for that animal. So that's probably why normoxia and hyperoxia don't show a temperature size rule. But um, it at least confirms the, the hypothesis that oxygen as a limiting resource might be a necessary condition in order to generate a, a temperature size rule. Um, so that's basically uh, the end of part three, uh, where I think that taking an oxygen perspective to uh, understand thermal effects might be especially helpful in, in water breeders. Um, and as I've tried to argue that the, the, the regulatory capacity uh, of the animal is really limited because they have to balance this, 
these two opposing risks of poisoning and, and asphyxiation. Temperature does affect the metabolic scaling, so the, the, the scaling exponent itself, but only in water breeders. Um, and effects of uh, size and oxygen supply, on oxygen supply and demand may actually help to resolve this uh, life history enigma of the temperature size rule. So one of the questions which I want to focus on in the future uh, is basically if, if oxygen supply is, is affected both by um, the, the, the temperature in terms of the effects of temperature on uh, diffusion, but also the effects of temperature on viscosity. And oxygen supply and demand are also affected by body size. So what is then the optimal body size uh, by which the animal can balance those two opposing risks well. So you, can, you could imagine that um, given a, s a certain respiratory strategy, for example, gills or tegument breeding, you could model um, how much oxygen it can take up, how much oxygen it needs to spend at a given temperature, and then you can change the temperatures and see if the animal uh, does well in, in this balance or not. Uh, and by modeling that, we might arrive at some optimal size and then we can see if those predictions relate well to the real world. And possibly the modeling would involve that, but um, like I said, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a novice on that. So um, if anybody has any input on, on this question, then please let me know as well. So uh, for now, I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll uh, be happy to answer them. Thank you, Wilco, for this fascinating uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, of course, uh, I'm full of questions. And one question you ask yourself uh, struck me. You say, from why don't organisms increase their uptake capacity? And, and then you conclude that is evolutionarily very difficult. Mm -hmm. And behind that question is the idea that more is better which I not fully understand. And I want to reflect you on a very simple observation that I uh, that everybody can make, and that is in mammals, uh, they support fertile development. And the uptake capacity, uh, capacity of the blood of the, of the fetus is way higher than that of the mother to in order to take over the oxygen from the blood of the mother mm -hmm. to that of the fetus. And at birth, they need to rapidly change their hemoglobin to uh, avoid uh, uh, toxic effects no. of oxygen. And I'm not sure about, for instance, in peripatus, but uh, which also sports fertile development. But I think this is this is more in general pattern. And so I don't see so much why the increase of oxygen. Uh, uptake capacity is such an evolutionary bottleneck. And can you perhaps say a few words why you think that more is better? Yeah. So uh, the idea is that if you can take up more oxygen, um, then uh, you're better off in, in generating energy, provided food is there. Um, and so that's generally seen as increasing fitness and increasing everything. Um, but of course, there's a, uh, well, the, the, there's a two sides of the metal, if you like. So if you have too much oxygen and you don't use it, then you can become uh, poisoned by, by having too much oxygen. And of course, there are ways of compensating for that, for instance, by having different affinities of hemoglobin for oxygen and, and switching between those things. And animals actually do do that. Um, but if the rate limiting step is not how much oxygen you can transport inside your body, but how quickly it can diffuse over your gill membranes, then you can have all the high affinity hemoglobin in the world, but it's not going to help you getting the oxygen out of the environment. So there are all these steps in the oxygen cascade, and each of those steps might be rate limiting or not. Um, but the idea is that the animal really has to balance that. So it doesn't have to, it, it's not only about maximizing the oxygen uptake under this set of activity, but it has to be able to flexibly regulate so, so that it has enough oxygen during the whole life cycle. And I think your example with the fetus uh, 
uh, is, is a very interesting one because it, it shows that during the, when the fetus is still inside the womb, it really needs to have this high affinity to prevent asphyxiation. And then as soon as it leaves it, the environment differs. And then, of course, it has to change the respiratory chain again in order to, to actually match oxygen supply in the mom because otherwise it would be poisonous. So, yes, there are evolutionary abilities to, 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 to differ that. Um, but, and, and, peop and, and animals use those, or evolution has over the course of time uh, made some adaptations there. Uh, but what I would like to argue is that for aquatic animals, it's uh, inherently more difficult to, to be flexible because, because of the problem with getting the oxygen out of the water and, and the, the, the costs involved in moving the, the dense and viscous water. But we can discuss that in, in more detail if you like. Other questions? Hi, I, I came across uh, <coughs> an experiment from literature where lethal effects on a water breathing animal were dependent on both uh, temperature and exposure time. So the, the animal would take three days to die at 25 degrees, say, but would die straight away at 27. So my question is, would those delayed effects uh, also fit uh, into the supply versus demand mismatch uh, framework uh, or are other mechanisms needed? Yeah, so it's an interesting point because uh, I'm, I'm collaborating with uh, Enrico, who, who developed that idea, Enrico Resende, on, uh, on the time effect. So indeed, if you look at thermal tolerance, it's not a fixed value, it's not a temperature, but it's a, a tolerance of temperature for an amount of time. So it's temperature per time, actually. Um, and in my experiments, I used a fixed rate of heating, so 0.25 degrees per minute. Uh, so that also translates into a, a time of exposure. Um, but I didn't change the time of exposure, but I kept the rate constant. So for my experiment, you can still compare the temperature values. But the interesting bit is, of course, uh, do the animals still do the same thing if you have slower heating rates or faster heating rates? Basically asking the question if, if the effect of oxygen on thermal tolerance changes from uh, being very acute to being more chronic. And of course, for ecological relevance, you would like to know if the effect of oxygen still works, not if I do my experiments on one afternoon, but if I want to rear animals throughout our life. Um, so we're currently working on that, but it's a good question, yeah. But one thing is, like, I can understand if it's a matter of minutes, but days, can the animal survive if it's like, how can it possibly take days to run out of oxygen? Yeah, so you can maybe liken it to running. If you have to run a marathon, you can't run it too quickly, but you can still make up. If you do a sprint, you can actually increase your speed even more. But if you have to r walk for days and days, you need to really uh, get a lower level of, uh, of, of activity. Uh, and, and so an animal might actually be able to meet oxygen demand for a short time by just ventilating like crazy. Uh, but if it has to keep up doing that for days and days, then oxygen might become uh, much more important, but only for lower temperatures. So there, there is an analogy there, but um, I hope to let you know in a half a year or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We have time for a quick question. Uh, well, just to, sh to suggest another answer to the question, uh, there is a flux issue and the oxygen debt issue probably going on. So if you're not spending much oxygen uh, or and you're getting a small supply, it'll take longer to hit the value where you can't uh, support your basic metabolism and then you die. Um, Thank you.